Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Ask Us Anything AEC panel discussion. I think this is our fifth or sixth time we've done this over the past year or so. It's been very popular. Uh, my name is TJ. I'm going to kind of walk you through it today. Let's talk a little bit about CAD. So CAD Microsystems has been around a long time, over 30 years. Uh, you probably know us as the people who sell you software, but we're also a full service consulting firm. We provide training, help desk support, and consulting around the design build operate industry. We have a team of re industry recognized experts, including several of them today. They're all published authors, registered architects, engineers, construction experts. They're top rated speakers at Autodesk University and built. Um, it's a great array of consultants that we have, and you're going to see a few of them today. So our customers call us when they're frustrated with their design processes and technology, and they want to improve efficiency. They want to add new capabilities, win more work, stay competitive. All of these things we can help. We take an educational approach to solving your challenges, and we're laser focused on helping you achieve your goals, your outcomes that you desire. And that's why we're presenting this webinar today to answer some of the questions that you have and get you directly connected to our team of experts. So who are those experts? Well, I may not be answering very many questions today. That's why I have everybody else. But uh, like I said, my name's TJ. I've been in the industry over 25 years. I'm a registered architect, um, recognized expert in BIM, uh, Revit, AutoCAD, Kobe, FM. Uh, that's been kind of what I've focused on. Uh, last year, I was the president of our AIA Northern Virginia chapter. That was a great experience. Um, and let's talk about some of the other people that we have today. So today, I have Pervy Irwin with us. She's also a licensed architect. Um, she has been in the industry over 15 years. She's a highly rated speaker. She's an Autodesk expert elite, um, which is a very small group of Autodesk experts who have uh, contributed greatly, and she's a huge thought leader. Marissa's with us today. She's our practice manager for infrastructure. She has over 25 years of experience with Autodesk products. Um, she is an expert in Civil 3D and AutoCAD and MAP um, and even Land Desktop back when people used to use that. She's a Bluebeam certified uh, technical expert as well. Let's move on to Matt Haraka. If you have joined us for our previous ones, Matt wasn't with us, so we're welcoming him today to our show. And he is our construction expert. He's our practice manager for construction, has 14 plus years of experience in the industry, both in the field and VDC. Um, he has a ton of experience. He knows a lot about BIM 360, Bluebeam, AutoCAD, and all the construction software that you might be using. Also joining us newly today is Alan Levy. So Alan's been with us for many years. He has a ton of experience. He's a super expert in Revit and AutoCAD and, and how those work together. Um, he has a structural background, so he'll be a, a great asset for us today. Chris Lindo has been a veteran of these webinars um, and he has a ton of experience. He, he was a BIM manager at a large, uh, uh, design build engineering firm for many years, uh, understands VDC, understands engineering, expert in Bluebeam and Revit um, and AutoCAD. And then rounding out our panel today is Eden. So Eden is our CAD care program manager. She oversees our CAD care uh, certified help desk program. She has a, a bunch of experience. You've probably dealt with her if you've ever called in um, and she's she's wonderful and can answer all of our questions today on licensing and, and any kind of tech support issues that you might have. So how's this gonna work? Oh, here's our, here's our picture from when we did this in December, I forgot uh, when we had our ugly sweaters. So um, we've opened up these questions. Uh, you've been adding questions as you've been in the, the webinar. Some of you have submitted questions previously, and we're gonna dive right in and start to talk about some of these questions uh, today. So um, I'm going to kick it off uh, with uh, a question we get all the time. I'm going to turn this over to Pervy. And this is a question about Revit file sizes. You know, what is the maximum size? And 
you know, how does that relate to performance and what is recommended and any tools or tips you can give to help us with this? So, right. Pernie, I'll turn it over to you. Sounds great. So, welcome everybody. Uh, so, yeah, so Revit file size. So, that's something that I've dealt with for a very long time. And typically, I think, you know, the question asked, you know, independent of your computer, uh, performance but in a way it's sort of linked together because obviously the more RAM you have you know the more you can process your files because the file size has a direct impact on the the performance I think you know generally I think we try to say you know four or five hundred megs for a single file it also kind of depends on how many files you have how big your project is you know for example if you're doing a multi-story residential building that's got like 30 or 40 stories and a whole bunch of different unit types, you typically want to break some of that up. Some of it is for performance, some of it is just for, I like to say security, so that if something crashes, it doesn't crash your whole project. Just kind of keeping some of those things that are more prone to cause problems separate, like for example, units, which are usually model groups, and we all know how finicky those can be. They can be great, but they can also be finicky, so kind of separating some of that uh, definitely doing model maintenance regularly. I would say that making sure you're controlling your warnings will probably do more for your performance uh, than some other things. Making sure that you're purging, that you're kind of deleting out unused views. Some of the performance issues aren't just actually how fast is the Revit model switching between views and things like that, but it's how quickly can I find what I need in my model, right? So not having too many unnamed sections all over the place or a bunch of extra families that you don't need will also help with reducing your file size and reducing actual user efficiency. So I know there are many of us on the panel who work with Revit, so there may be some other tips from, from other folks. Yeah, I would add, Pervy, that probably one of the best tricks you can do to help make your manager Revit file size is to periodically save as a whole new file. It's, it's amazing point. the way the, the Revit database works is as people are saving to it, it's just throwing in data wherever it can find a spot. But when you do a save as and build a whole new Revit project and a whole new RVT file with the save as command, it'll restructure that. And I have many times seen a reduction of file size of upwards of 40%. We just had one recently where it was an 800 megabyte file and by simply doing a save as, it went down to 480 megabytes. And the, the performance greatly improved. Yeah, and, and that's and that's we call that refreshing the model, which is kind of part of the you know audit, purge, uh, review warnings, you know, archiving process. Now I just want to make one point that in it's a little bit different in BIM 360 and that you can't really save on top of an old model in BIM 360. So it's a little bit of a different uh, process if you're gonna be doing it on a local server versus in the in the cloud. If we touch base on BIM 360, I can actually um, go over some of the specifications for the file sizes in terms of working with Revit to BIM 360. Um, if you're using uh, fields, I believe it's like a, a one gigabyte max, but if you're using like current or um, the, the next gen M360 or whatever the current one is, which is the um, Autodesk Construction Cloud uh, BIM Collaborate version, then you don't have a file limit necessarily. Uh, but if you have like attachments and things like that, they, they'll have a they'll have a limit of 20 megabytes. Um, but yeah, other than that, fields can accommodate up to a gigabyte and BIM 360 next gen has no limitations. But you know, you might want to have the things that the other panelists were talking about in consideration so that those files actually load well um, and you know you can share them and everything's running smoothly. Good. Um, let's move on to another question we have here. Um, Marissa, this question about um, an error somebody's having with W block copying Autodesk Civil 3D. Let me see if I can understand it. Um, they are copying from one drawing to another in AutoCAD. And when they do, they get W block or copy operation rejected due to a proxy object that doesn't allow copying. Mm -hmm. It's mostly coming from Carlson um, to AutoCAD or AutoCAD Civil 3D. Do you have any insight on this question? I do. Um, this can often happen when you were working more with, you know, intelligent objects, but you're trying to then bring them into um, AutoCAD, which doesn't understand them. That's why they're proxy objects. 
Um, the best thing to do here is to make sure that you have the Civil 3D Object Enabler installed in, on top of your AutoCAD. That will allow it to understand those objects, at least enough to put them in there. Um, now, in terms of having the issues going from Civil 3D um, or going from Carlson into Civil 3D, where it says you're having those kinds of issues as well, um, that may be you know that that's a little bit difficult for me to address because I don't I would need to know a little bit more about your setup. I mean, if you're using Carlson um, on basic AutoCAD, or are you using Carlson on top of something else? It, it's or are you using just the standalone Carlson? It's kind of hard to know that. Um, but the object enabler should absolutely help with the error when you're trying to take something from Civil 3D into say Carlson if it was on top of AutoCAD or just regular AutoCAD. You have to have that object enabler. Cool. Thank you, Marissa. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And where um, do you get that object enabler? You oh, get that object enabler. You can actually download it from the Autodesk website. <laughs> Is it one specifically for civil 3D? Yes, right? it's specifically yeah. for civil 3D, and you will want to make sure it actually says civil 3D object enabler. You, you need go. to download the one that is specific to your AutoCAD version. So if you have AutoCAD 2018, you need to get the 2018 civil 3D object enabler, and so on and so forth. Um, you want to also be careful because if, you know, Civil 3D, you were working in Civil 3D, which was 20, you know, 2019, and you're trying to do this in AutoCAD 2017, that may not work because Civil 3D doesn't go backwards very well. Um, so you want to be aware of that issue that might be there. When all else fails, if you really need to get stuff into AutoCAD and for some reason it's still not working, if you don't need it to stay intelligent, you just need it so that you can plot it or, or do other things with it, just snap to it. You can do um, the export to AutoCAD from Civil 3D, and that takes all of those intelligent Civil 3D objects and sort of dummies them down to basic AutoCAD objects, which can be read by any, basically any version of AutoCAD. All right, let's do another AutoCAD question really quick, then we'll switch gears. Um, so we got this question from Kathy, and when she switched to a newer version of AutoCAD, she lost the ability to have her tool palettes with the blocks that she had set up. So Alan, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Um, can you give a little insight on this? So I um, requested to field this question because me and Kathy and Felix and, well not Liz, we all spoke uh, earlier last week and uh, I'm gonna be helping them out a little bit with uh, some plotting issues that they're having, but let me share my screen. Uh, let's I'll see. make you the presenter, Alan. One second. Thank you. There you go. So the thing with tool palettes, can you see? All right. So um, the thing with tool palettes is that when, and I'm going to assume that Kathy, you sort of created your own tool palettes. You created blocks, and you drag them into the tool palette. And then you install a new version of AutoCAD. Well, the thing about tool palettes is that they, if I right click and I go to properties, they refer to a particular drawing file. So they're referencing a drawing file that that block is in. Another thing you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to go to options and you're gonna need to add the path for where your tool palettes are. So if you have older tool palettes, you can um, uh, path to those. So let me show you in options here on the files tab, there is a tool palette file location. So wherever your old tool palettes are, you're gonna have to point this path to that palette. And you got to make sure the drawings that reference those blocks that are on the tool palette are also, you, you have access to that or that drawing is still available somewhere. So that when you do click on it, it knows to find that block in that drawing. But um, we can take this uh, when we, uh, I'll talk to you guys about this uh, when we, when, when I get scheduled for you guys. But for everybody else, uh, that's a little bit about AutoCAD tool palettes. Good, thank you, Alan. I'm gonna steal back here. Okay, so I've 
Matt's nice face up on the screen here. I'm gonna turn this one over to Matt. We're gonna switch gears and talk about BIM 360 here. Um, so the, the question comes over about, can you see the latest model without having a license of BIM 360? Yes, you absolutely can. So as long as the latest Revit model has been published to BIM 360, as long as you have a seat of docs and you have access to the folder and document management, which the model uh, resides, you can see the latest version of the model, as well as, depending on your permissions, any other versions of the model which may exist inside the hub. So related to this, Matt, um, we had another question too. How about the markup? Does the markup remain when a new version of the model is published? The markup does remain when a new version of the uh, model is published. Now, if you go backwards and you look at a previous version, any markups that have been added after that version will disappear. So you can see a real-time uh, snapshot of what the model or the drawings looked at inside of your hub um, at that moment in time. Pervy, did you want to show something related to this? Uh, yeah, so I wanted to, I know we've gotten this question before and I've helped clients with it, you know, who want to share the BIM 360 model with um, somebody who doesn't have Revit who, or who doesn't have BIM 360. So I'm going to uh, share just how to quickly um, do that. I'll make sure you guys are seeing. Are you seeing my Revit screen? We see M files. Oh. Okay, one second. I had to pick the right screen. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Now we see Revit? Yes. Okay, perfect. So play. Let me see the. Okay, perfect. So inside of BIM 360, here's a project that's on BIM 360. And over here in the Collaborate tab, at the very end of the ribbon, you have this little shared views. Um, so what you do is you open a view that you want to share and you hit this little shared views button and it actually opens this little palette over here on the side and you click this new shared view over here. Okay. And it will say, okay, you're going to name it. So I'm going to say, you know, overall axon, whatever I want to call it. And I hit share. And what it does is it actually creates a link that you can then send to anybody. So um, you can send that link to literally anybody that you want. Um, I have some other ones in here that are already processed, so I'll just show you one of those. If I go over here, I can say, I can copy this link, and then I'm going to open up a browser, and I'll just paste that link in here. And it, what it does is it opens it in what's called the Autodesk Viewer. And so in the viewer, it's taking a second. That one already expired. Yeah, it's loading. Um, it will show you the, the model, and you can actually, this is a different model, but that's fine. It'll show you in here, you can orbit around it, um, you can use the pan tool, the zoom tool, you can measure, you can actually even cut like sections through it. Um, and this, anybody can, you can share this with anybody and they can do this. So they can't edit the model, but they can investigate the model. They can cut through it. Actually, one of the coolest things is, um, there's, let me turn that off. You can actually explode the model so you can kind of like pull it apart and see it here. And this is something that you can do in the viewer mode. You can't do it in sort of the regular BIM 360, um, clicking on the project, there's a few other places you can do it. So this is how you can actually share something with someone who doesn't have Revit or doesn't have BIM 360, but if they want to be able to uh, play with it in Revit, like if they know Revit but they don't have a license to it, you can actually install Revit in viewer mode and then you can play around with the model and you can do things, you just can't save it, uh, any of the changes that you make, but you can install Revit, install it in viewer mode and use it that way if you want to use the software itself. Um, Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to turn this over now to Eden because we get this question a lot, which is, you know, is, is Autodesk planning on fixing bugs or improving their software in any way? And 
Uh, of course, the answer is yes. But Eden's going to go into a little bit more detail on kind of how that works and how you can provide input to that. Eden, do you want to share your screen? Or do you want me to bring uh, up the, the, the website? Um, if you want, yeah, feel free. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on sharing the screen. I was just going to um, okay. kind of talk in, in through the question here from Mike. Um, so the first, the first part of the question is, <laughs> yeah, of course, um, there's, always, there's always updates that are coming out um to pretty much you know every software under every suite possible one thing i would say is you can look and see um specifically if you're having an issue that you want to know if it's being addressed what you can do is you can search for the version of software that's affected that you're using and you can actually find current known issues for that version um a simple google search would, would tell you it'll pull up an autodesk uh, knowledge network um article for whatever the version of that software is, but it'll tell you, it'll list out all the issues that they're aware of, that they've tested, that they that they know and that they're working on fixing. Uh, so that's one thing. You can you can kind of go there and verify if your if your specific concern is being addressed already. Um, the other thing, and I think probably the page that TJ is talking about bringing up is uh, the ideas page on um, on the Autodesk website. So here's a place where you can pretty much go and share like community ideas or, or, or feedback that you would like to see turned into a feature. So if you want to see, um, you know, I would like this specific issue to be addressed. That's one thing you can do if you don't want to submit a, a normal bug report. But additionally, you could also go in here and say, hey, you know, I think it'd be good if we could track somehow affected issues for us in the Autodesk account, right? That's a cool, I mean, that's a cool idea. Somebody might pick that up and say, hey, that's that's great. Why don't we why don't we work on bringing that feature and that functionality to the Autodesk account? And then people can see, they, you know, they can say, oh, my, this is my issue. And, um, you know, I want to track and see when that's fixed and when a fix is coming. So that, that might be something to do as well. Uh, but I would definitely say, look at the actual known issues for that um, and, and kind of go from there start with the version that you're on as well. And you can always reach out to our help test team too if you have some specific questions about a bug or if you have specific questions about the version that you're working in and if other people are seeing that issue. Um, I know the one that you brought up uh, with was specifically, I don't see the question now, I think it got moved. Um, but I think that the one you brought up, I had noticed some, some things about that for like the 2016 uh, version but I'm not sure that one's not in support anymore. So if that's the version you're working in, I can I can say pretty uh, surely that that's not going to have a fix come out. Um, but yeah, if you have further questions on that, just reach out to our help desk team. Let us know what version you're working in. Uh, show us an example of what you're seeing, um, and we can look into that for you if you have any questions. DJ. And, and I'll add to what Eden's saying too. Is obviously yeah. here's the Revit ideas page. There's an AutoCAD ideas page. E each of the products have an ideas page in the forums in the community. Um, Revit also has a public roadmap that you can search for. So this is literally the things that are going to be added to Revit at some point. And you'll see things that have been added or on their way to being added. And many of these come from those ideas pages. So um, this is a great place to kind of see what's going to happen. And, and it doesn't say the exact dates, but, but many of these are happening so like this tapered walls. If I look at this tapered walls, I'm not going to give anything away, but I suspect you're going to see tapered walls very soon in Revit. I think we already have that, don't we? Oh, oh no, we have uh, slanted walls. Yes, slanted walls. Slanted walls. But I have something to add to Mike's question really quick. If you're yeah. experiencing uh, a delay in AutoCAD that um, – to, as he wrote there, hours, which there's, I would say there's something uh, up with the drawing. And some very easy things that you can do are maybe do an audit, just type in audit at the command line, run through the audit to kind of clean the drawing up to see if there's something wrong with it, purge, and so forth. But generally, what you're describing, I don't know that it's a specifically a bug. It could be the particular uh, drawing. One way to test this is open up a fresh drawing, try the same command. If a command works there, then it's something up with the drawing. Make sure to save frequently too. Don't don't be in a spot where you're losing hours of work. Right? Smash that Control S or Command S, whatever you're in. Um, 
definitely in, yeah. in anything. <laughs> okay, let's switch gears. Um, Marissa, we have one for you, very specific to Civil 3D about station labels on alignments. Yep. Um, having trouble showing the the annotation or not showing the annotation on the curve labels when they want to. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about this one. Okay, awesome. So, um, really, it's important to understand that you know in in this in this question, uh, Norman, you mentioned that you're used to things being annotative and you can set their scales and things like that. When you're working with those intelligent civil 3D labels that are you know the stationing on the alignments or the curve labels that you've that you've placed on the alignments and they're dynamically related to the alignment the civil 3d labels do not they're not annotative in fact the ability for those things to scale themselves automatically was in civil 3d way before the concept of annotative text was in autocad so they do not behave the same they're very very different they are labels, they are not text. So they do not have that annotative sort of quality there or that property, they are always annotative no matter what, and they will show up at any scale. The way to get around this is basically in the label styles that you're setting up, put your station labels on one layer, and maybe that is you know C dash row dash anno dash SDAT for station, um, but then put your curve labels on another layer. And then you basically use viewport layer control to say, okay, well, just I, you know, in this particular viewport, turn on this layer and this layer, but in this other viewport, I don't want that one that the curve labels are on. And that's all done inside of the label styles. And that's really the best way to control that because it doesn't work the same as basic AutoCAD annotative text. These are way more intelligent labels and they are totally different objects. So they behave differently. Really the best thing to do use two separate layers in the different types of label styles and then use the viewport layer control to only turn on the ones that you want. Great, thank you, Marissa. All right, let's keep it going. The questions are coming in. So Chris, I'm gonna turn this over to you. This is a good question. It's a BIM 360 question. Um, is our project phasing tool that can be used when publishing the models? Is there a tool to export clash detection reports from the project hub? So, uh, so good question here. So um, when it comes to phasing, you can obviously get that inside uh, inside a Revit, your actual Revit model, right? So any sort of phases that you create inside your Revit model can actually be utilized in the BIM 360 uh, viewer, right? So when you uh, when you create those uh, phases, again, make sure that your uh, your models or your, your elements are on the correct phases. When you get them over into BIM 360, uh, you should be able to, uh, to kind of filter your view, kind of change around your view uh, to be able to look at those phases um, and also uh, even if you have uh, sheets that you also uh, created inside Revit, right? A lot of people create phasing sheets uh, uh, where it uh, shows you a demo, it shows you new construction, so on and so forth. Uh, when you export that into BIM 360, uh, you can use published settings to publish those uh, those sheets, and then you can take a look at those sheets as well. And it should show you everything that those sheets uh, basically see. Um, as far as clashes go, uh, inside uh, BIM 360, inside the clash coordination or the coordination hub, uh, you'll be able to uh, to filter out your list, see all those clashes. Okay, um, I do know that there's going to be a, a better uh, a better feature of archiving those clashes so that you can actually see them. Uh, uh, take or sorry, see them and export them a little bit easier. Um, there's also integration with Navisworks, right? So then you can also get those clash reports for Navisworks. Okay. All right. Let's do. Let's uh, switch over to Eden. So Eden, we had a question about, frankly, running AutoCAD on a MacBook, uh, a MacBook Pro with the new M1 chip. Do you do you have some advice on that? You guys make me work for my money now. I have all the questions today. I'm loving it. Um, so. The AutoCAD version uh, for Mac, I, I'm i not wholly familiar with um, because I, you know, I, I worked with Macs a lot back in the day, um, but but now I don't do it necessarily. So I had to do a little bit of research for this one. And um, 
one of the things that that kept coming up when I was when I was looking through for this one is that like the arc text command it doesn't exist for the Mac. I don't I don't know if that's old or if it still doesn't. It still doesn't seem like it's really around. Um, so what I what I did find though is I actually found you a forum post that'll um, that that seems to address this. It looks like there's a tutorial on how to do it. Um, and they're they're suggesting using like path arrays to to accomplish this. Um, in terms of the actual MacBook that you have, I mean it's good, it's modern, it's fine. Uh, there should be no issues there. I think it's more so limited support with auto desk products and Mac products. Um, pretty much any standard version of AutoCAD you should be able to run uh, to address the first part of your question there. Um, AutoCAD LT or just regular AutoCAD either should be fine as long as you're not using you know some of the ones I saw that address the same question were like back from 2015. So as long as you're not in there. Um, but but yeah, this tutorial, this article seems to be pretty recent. I'm sorry, this forum post is pretty recent. It's from 2020. So I'm gonna shoot that uh, into the chat or over to uh, Allison to provide to you. And just see maybe going through those steps that, that might help out, but um, it does look like this might be a good option for using that ideas page in AutoCAD. Um, tell them you want an easy way to put arced text <laughs> in AutoCAD. Let me okay. go ahead and send that uh, that link. Good, thank you, Eden. Okay, let's um, let's go a little bit higher level now. Uh, this question is from Chris, uh, and and he's asking about really boil down to what's the best way to create a model of an existing facility that can be used to manage that facility for asset management, space management, um, O and M. You know, what is, what do we think is the best path for that right now? So I'm going to turn this over to Chris and Matt together. I think you both have some good insight on this. Matt, would you like to start? <laughs> oh, I think he's, uh, he's muted there. And we're not muted anymore. All right. So, yeah, one of the, the best way to capture existing conditions is is definitely with a, a 3D model by create, taking a LiDAR scanner, terrestrial base, UAV base, uh, whichever way you can, either legal requirements or physically being able to access the object in which you're trying to capture. You want to collect that point cloud and create a real ex existing conditions with geometric data, right? Hopefully this can be on coordinates, so you'd be working in conjunction with a survey team or a higher end object, which could geo-reference the points that you're collecting. And then once you collect this, you're going to either use a really good uh, BIM, uh, scan to BIM team, or a variety of third-party products which are out there which can extract hard edges and also uh, using all sorts of different types of AI, identify what objects really are, which takes some of that uh, manual process out, but there really isn't an automatic button. And then once you create that BIM asset, Usually, I would hand it over to my architect team, which where I'll naturally hand it over to Chris, and he will start to build out the rest of the information. Right, exactly. So just like what Matt had, had uh, said previously, you want to get that set up uh, initially uh, with uh, with your point cloud, move it over into the uh, into the Revit side of things or the 3D modeling, right? But then really focus on well, what what are we really looking at? Do we want to uh, have a, a high end uh, model that has all of the really you know bells and whistles that we really want to see in the model you know with all the uh with all the uh, interesting architecture uh work and, and all of that detail or really are we just looking for information right there's a lot of really great um uh, uh tools and uh and, and uh, families out there that are really just kind of basic families with a lot of data attached to them right and obviously with facility management and uh, historic preservation the more data you have the better off you will be now, that Revit uh, model is essentially just a database of all that information. You can show it 3D graphically, right? But then you're building a database. You can build schedules, export those schedules to Excel, be able to create your sheets uh, at different phases. Um, there's a couple of ways to kind of think about your project as well. There might be an as-built uh, project versus a facility management uh, project, things like that. And we could certainly, uh, uh, this is actually a really interesting uh, question. I can go on for hours about this, but uh, really, um, if you want to get more information and kind of figure out um, what your next best step is, I would say reach out to us so that we can actually talk you through it and get a little bit better idea of what you're really trying to do. 
Yeah, I, I want to add to this because I spend a lot of time working with owners who are implementing BIM, which includes models. And, you know, the, for an owner to purchase their own scanning equipment and scan it and turn it into a model, it is certainly possible, but it is usually not cost effective. There are, you know, there are firms out there that, that we partner with, too, that that can build these models for you much more accurately, much higher quality and much more efficiently than you could and learn that process. And many of these um, many of these companies have actually built their own proprietary software to semi automate this process. So um, I would say that you're if you want to do scanning, typically scanning on your own, you would want to limit to smaller areas like mechanical rooms where you really need it. But if you need buildings constructed, your um, models of your buildings constructed, you're much better off partnering with a firm like ours who can get that done at a high quality for you. Um, there are certainly ways to do it, and but you have to think downstream, you have to think about standards, you have to think about the data flow, and so you want to put all of that in place before you start scanning and putting things together. All right, let's um, let's do a quick one here, Pervy. We had somebody ask about the process to become an architect. I assume, what, you know, based on what we do, we'll focus on kind of the the software part of that. Um, it versus asked us anything, architect. so they asked us anything. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. That's true. So. For sure. um, Pervy, do you want to jump on that really quick? Yeah, definitely. So, so I'm part of a an interesting generation that really bridged the the 2D to 3D and the hand drawing to you know the BIM uh, workflows. And so I think that you know one of the best things you can do is to is to learn the software, right? I mean, learning Revit is going to really help you in terms of getting getting that skill set that you need to jump into the industry, but also having actual construction. Uh, expertise will be invaluable for you to understand because in order to use Revit you need to understand how buildings go together so if you can work in construction or you can do things like that I mean the year that I spent doing construction administration in my last job I learned so much more about how buildings go together and how to build better Revit models from being on the construction site and you know learning how to put the things together so I would say get as much practical experience as you can uh, you can join their local organizations all over the place that you can join to go on tours of buildings when we could do those things again and things like that but just kind of attend any seminars that you can learn the software uh you know follow people on linkedin and on twitter who are really good at the technology and you'll get a better understanding of what types of skills you need to jump into that good thank you pervy Yep, sorry, I left Matt's I left Matt's mug up while we were while Pervy was talking. I apologize. Um, How could you do that? Let's switch over to Marissa. Marissa, a, a question came in from Nicolette about um, point markers. Do you want to address that question? Absolutely, and I would like to show my screen if you could pass that to me, please. Oh yes, I love it. All yours. All right, let's get this up and going over here. All right, <clears throat> so the issue um, was that you're having a problem where your trees are coming in too big. Um, the you know you may have put in the point, but the symbol itself is huge. Now there's a couple of ways to address this depending upon how the point was created and how the point is uh, assigning its own styles. Um, because points can be given styles really in three ways. You can either manually do it, you can just have it follow the point group styles, or you can have description keys do an automatic assignment of styles to the points. So the first place to look is you want to make sure that under your point styles, we go here with the point, and then I'll go down to point styles, and I have this one here called tree. So the first thing you need to check is in here in the point style itself on the marker tab you have this options of how to size it. Now this can be sized in a number of different ways, either based on a drawing scale, a fixed scale in absolute units, as you can see here, you know, I always wants the tree to be 20 feet or whatever. Um, so you wanna check that first because this is what's going to affect it almost immediately. Now, if you are 
using description keys to bring in the tree points and having them sort of resize, as you can see here, just based on the description like I have here, you want to make sure that your scale parameter is set to the right thing. This is my description key list. So you want your scale parameter, make sure it's set to the right parameter. And then these are the key here, this uh, fixed scale factor, use a drawing scale, apply to X, Y. These will directly affect the size of that symbol if, it's, if it uses a description key to, to apply its own styles. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if you, if you for example, create a point, so I'm gonna go point here, miscellaneous, I'm just gonna create a manual point. And if I place a tree down here and I'm going to say um, tree, actually, let me do uh, something that, let me make sure I get the right one here. Like let's do an ash. So if I do ash um, and then space, let's say 36, then what will actually happen, I'm just gonna give us sort of a dummy elevation that doesn't really matter. So what will happen is it takes a look at that first parameter that I put in. So I have the description and then there was the parameter and the parameter is used in conjunction with this. So I used the ash, I gave it a scale factor of 0 0.083 so that it's not you know, making this into something monstrous, it's actually bringing it down. You're typing in feet versus inches, you know, you wanna sort of be prepared for that. Um, and then you have to tell it, do you want to apply that to the X, Y? Um, so if you want this to just be scaled so that it's much smaller, it's always like maybe 0.1 inches or whatever else, you can tell it to use the drawing scale to help you figure out the sizing here. But usually this is the key if you're using description keys of why they're coming in too big, is if you didn't knock this down because it thinks you wanna draw it in inches and so it's trying to, to make it, it multiplies it by 12, you have to say, no, no, don't multiply it by 12. You know, let's let's bring it back down. Let's, let's scale the whole thing by 0 0.083, put it back into feet, because it, it reads these as inches by default. It's very strange. Um, but once you do that, that should bring it back down to the size that it should be. So again, two things to count or two things to check. First, check that point style itself. That may be all you need if you're not using description keys. If you are using description keys, make sure you come in here and, and change your fixed scale factor there. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Marissa, let's, um, let's move on to this next one. Chris, I'm gonna turn this over to you, this question that came in from Thierry, which is um, about graphics cards and about BIM 360. Do you know the, the question I'm talking about here? Yeah. You know, most of you have state-of-the-art graphics cards, navigation feels smooth, but some clients don't have them. Uh, can we address that? Um, <clears throat> yes and no. Uh, really, it, when it when it comes to BIM 360, it's it's a it's a browser or browser based service, right? So really, what you're looking at is the best uh, practices in just keeping your system or your tablet, your your device, basically uh, up to date. Obviously, make sure that the uh, the latest version is uh, is up to date, so it has its latest uh, uh, um, uh, firmware. Um, and then also uh, 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 make sure that you have the latest application. So I would recommend uh, Chrome works really well in most devices, especially when it comes to BIM 360. Uh, I know that Firefox also has a really good uh, application for it as well. Um, but again, when it comes to BIM 360, it really is browser based. Um, I would say that if you're on site, connection really does matter. So you need a really good um, uh, uh, sort of Wi-Fi connection on site, or if you're just in a trailer, um, I would make it so if you can connect to a uh, to your Wi-Fi through a trailer or even through your phone in, in some instances, um, really that's the best practices that I can give you for that because again, it's a browser-based software. Matt, did you have anything to add or even TJ? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's exactly right. It's browser-based and there's no defined uh, requirements because it is browser based. Yeah, exactly. I, I can tell you, I, I run um, BIM 360 right on like a little $300 Lenovo and, it, and it's totally fine. So just make sure that you've got plenty of available resources for things like Chrome with a known memory hog, right? Um, mm -hmm. Make sure that make sure that your um, computer meets the minimum requirements for Chrome. Make sure Chrome is up to date or whatever browser you're using. Um, 
like Chris was saying, make sure you do regular things like uh, refresh um, either the website or reboot your computer. But to be honest, here's another big thing um, is it could be a, a network issue. If you're experiencing a lot of lag, if you feel like your browser is fine and um, you know something like that it could just be a simple network connection is not is not stable or quick enough to handle um m360 m360's platform My so that might be a thing to look your, into. yeah so so on top of that your it uh should be able to tell you if there's there's any sort of exceptions that need to be made uh for that connection yeah i will say too that um that Google has, um, for their Chrome browser, has mentioned that the next build is going to address this memory hog issue that Chrome is famous for. So we'll see. Fingers crossed on that. Ooh! Yeah. I'm not get too excited. Hey, Pervy, we had a follow-up to one of the, um, the, the question about um, getting into architecture. And Lionel asked mm -hmm. about uh, local organizations go on tours of buildings. You want to elaborate on that really quick? Sure. So the ones that I know of, so you're, I don't know where you are, but your local um, AIA, American Institute of Architects chapter, will have events. Uh, and right now I know a lot of them are doing online virtual events. So that's one. Uh, we're in the, the Washington, D.C. area. So there are a lot around here. There's also the Association for Preservation Technology. Um, APTI is the main organization. There are actually local ones. There's APT DC. They also do a bunch of tours. Um, I know that like different historic preservation organizations will do them so in dc like the dc preservation league will do some so looking at things like that looking at local architecture organizations local preservation organizations in your area they will often do those things and i get a lot of uh responses for things like i get a lot of uh, announcements for those online right now so they're still trying to do that um universities will also have lecture series and things like that so hopefully that helps Okay, Alan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. There's a good question in here, an AutoCAD question about line types. Um, Marissa, you may have some input on this too. Um, you know, having an issue reloading previously created custom line types, getting the error bad definition at line two. Do you have any insight on that? Did we lose Alan? Uh-oh. Alan, are you there? <laughs> okay, looks like Marissa, we might have lost. I, I have seen this before, um, and it actually can be due to a number of reasons. Um, one of the things that we have seen in the past is if you don't have <clears throat> the right textile, so maybe this particular, um, you know, maybe this particular line type is looking to, to put a piece of text like an E in an electrical line or even an X in a fence, um, and that x or e is looking for a text style to be in that drawing and maybe that was a text style that was in an older drawing but isn't in the current drawing um, this can happen if your um if your line type is trying to access an shx file you might get an error um, so there's a lot of different things that could cause this um, it, it's kind of it's kind of tough to say there there is a um i'm trying to think of there's there's a couple of different ways to to troubleshoot it. I mean, go in there and and take a look at maybe compare that line to other lines that are working. Um, but it might be tough because if you've got you know if it's airing out on line two, you don't really know. Um, so one thing you can do is if you take that one out, then run it again. You know, try and bring in others and see if it if that works. Um, it may not be an issue in the particular line type you're looking at. You need <clears throat> that you're trying to import. You need to look at that particular line, line two, in that line type file. Compare it to others. See if some of those work, but that one doesn't. You might be missing a comma. There again, it might be an SHX missing. It might be a, a textile missing, etc. Yeah, more than likely, it's an SHX file reference. That's mm -hmm. a problem is a, the line, a complex line type references a shape file, which is an SHX file, and that yeah. probably can't find the link to it. And if you put that SHX file in the same folder or one of your support file paths, that will probably solve it. Because if it was working before and it's not working now, that's probably why it's not working now. Yeah. I have. I, I just want to let you know that I'm sitting here and, and my power went out and then mm -hmm. everything went away. But I had, I don't know, I, I missed uh, the answer and I was, uh, I looked this up 
but I have a um, a uh, a link to a uh, web page that explains all this. So I put it in the chat for Allison. So <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thanks, Alan. Um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Eden now. We had a a difficult question, so I thought I'd dump it on her. Um, can someone address the licensing needs for clash detection in model coordination versus Navisworks and Collaborate Collaborate Pro terms? Can you handle that yeah. one, Eden? You know, to be honest, I think we might want to take this one offline um, okay. and and research it a little bit. I'm not totally, okay. I'm not 100% with the Navis. Um, with the Navis aspect there, I might have to go. I might have to go to sales and ask a little bit more about that. Can I? Is that something I can reach back out to that uh, to that person about? Yeah. So that, Brian, that we Brian? have to contact Brian, information okay. about that. Brian, we'll reach out to you and give you a call so we can discuss yeah. that in a little bit more detail with you. Yeah, I have to get some information from a few other sources to to verify that for you. Okay, good. I'm, I'm not 100% myself. Thanks, Eden. Um, Perby, we have one coming about. 3ds max haven't had a 3ds max question in a while what rendering tool do you recommend to use i typically use iray do you recommend using another one um so i don't i don't have too much 3ds max uh experience but i do have some clients that um will use have used v-ray for that uh i know that there's also you know some of the other rendering um options out there there's enscape there's lumion um and i know those other ones have connections to uh, SketchUp and to Revit. I'm not sure. I would think that they would have connections to 3ds Max too. And all of those um, are fairly easy to learn. So I mean, I know I know people who have very low tolerance for learning new things who've picked them up very quickly. So that's kind of my my uh, register of of how hard this software is to learn. So those are some of the other options that are out there. And they all have sort of different levels and different price points, obviously, but um, I think that they're all, they, the learning curve is relatively short for those types of software because people can kind of jump in and in a couple of hours be able to really do what they want. Mm -hmm. So I, if you don't mind, I want to jump in yeah. on this question uh, to TJ and Pervy, um, Pervy, getting my words all mixed up here. Um, but so I use 3DS uh, Max and Maya a lot with like, uh, game design and stuff like that. I'm not sure if that's what you're what you're using it for. Usually, that's where I see people coming from for um, in terms of like the media uh, modeling and things like that are coming with 3ds Max and Maya questions. But um, check out Redshift. That's a that's a GPU rendering engine that you can use with 3ds Max. That's a good one. iRay is good. There's there's nothing wrong with iRay. It, it's it's a uh, it, it's pretty standard. A lot of people like to use that one. Um, but you can also check out like I, I'm not sure if you're using anything like game engines, but Unreal Engine has a lot coming up with Autodesk products, and I mean that's just a beautiful rendering engine in general. It's a gaming engine, but it can be used for rendering uh, models, um, architecture models, anything pretty much. So I would check that one out, and it's totally free, um, and it's beautiful. So I'm. We have just a couple more questions. The, the ones we have left, I think, are ones we need to follow up with people because they're very specific and, and could be very um, detailed. So uh, I think what we're going to do is um, we're going to address one last question before we go today. Um, before we do that, I want to just let you know, um, you know, we're here to help. So if you have additional questions, if you need help with implementing the software, with understanding the software, with um, reviewing your workflows and making you more efficient we can do all of that and our team of experts is here to help so um, as we only have a few minutes left what i'm going to do is i want to open it up to another question that i think is a bigger broader question that many of us could could answer and so i'm going to kick it off here this was from jacob this is a really good question and he's here's how he said it bim's come a long way in the last few decades incorporating use from architects to engineers to construction managers and fabricators. Each of these changes seems to have been reactive for a lot of firms and that having it is the expectation. What do you think comes next for BIM and AEC? How would you recommend people get ready for that coming change instead of having to react after it's an expectation? Hopefully all of that carried through. My computer's giving me a lot of, of bumpiness here, but um, who wants to start that off? Who wants to give a um, their first take on 
kind of where BIM is going in the next few years? I can give you a little bit of an opinion here. So, um, so <clears throat> what I see uh, BIM kind of, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, BIM moving towards is uh, it's more integrated, more uh, smart building or smart building planning, if you will. Um, a lot of times we see, or sorry, we see a lot of technology, obviously, moving to a smart building uh, sort of system. Where I see BIM really kind of feeding into that is being able to plan for that ahead of time. What does that actually, what does that network look like? Uh, and how can we integrate our, our systems together to make a better uh, a better building, right? And to, uh, and to stop combating uh, a sick building syndrome, if you will, and, and rather uh, build a healthy building uh, uh, right from the get-go that's all integrated. That's where I see a lot of things going. Um, how to prep for that really is just to obviously uh, keep up to date with uh, with the what's what's coming out in software, right? So, uh, but even uh, even start to become more of a thought uh, leader in, in that sort of field, right? Not just what is our software doing and what what uh, what can we do with it, but how can we make that better? How can we also incorporate uh, a new uh, software, really new technology uh, into our day-to-day -day, uh, activities? I have, um, I can add something to that. So right now I support a lot of smaller interior design firms that are just coming to Revit. And it seems like the, the smaller companies are the ones that are now starting to get into it and realizing that there are a lot of benefits to being in BIM and to being in this more collaborative environment. And I think that the hardest thing is that the paradigm shift, right, from hand drawing to AutoCAD was not really a paradigm shift. It was really just, I'm taking what I did by hand and doing the computer, but going from 2D to 3D is really a paradigm shift. And I think what we have to do as designers, right, we're taught to think outside of the box, we're taught to think forward and, you know, use use our our brains to help us think of new creative ideas and you have to use that problem solver attitude when you're looking at using the next pieces of technology because i think that what i've found is that the the heart the people that struggle the most are the ones that really just have a hard time with making that shift and always wanting to say well this is how i did it here and how can i compare this to this and you can't always right it's not just like apples to oranges sometimes it's like you know, apples to like a steak, you know, I mean, they're just very, very different. And so you kind of have to think about, you have to come at it with this very open mind with this idea that I need to blow up everything that I know. And yes, it's scary, but again, and this is a little bit of marketing here, but we're here to help you do that. Right. So, I mean, I have, I have a small firm that literally has eight people who decided to go to Revit and BIM 360 all at once. And it's scary but they're doing they're doing well and they're getting into it and they're really finding the benefits of it and you know they're using it internally right now but they're starting to use it with other firms and i think that people are realizing that all the time that they wasted with all this manual stuff that they have to do now that it's all automated in this new in this, this technology system and inside of bim they're realizing that it's it's making them happier <laughs> because they don't have to do the tedious things right like all of the tedious stuff is automated, so you can focus on what I like to say, the fun part, which is the design and why we all got into this in the first place. So I wanna chime in here. There are a couple trends that I see that are that are happening in the industry. And in particular, for architects and engineers who traditionally design a project, hand it over, walk away. And I think that that business model has worked for a long time, but that business model is, seems to be shifting to where now what we're gonna see more and more is architects and engineers doing a digital representation of that building, but then helping the owners manage that digital representation. What you sometimes hear is called a digital twin. So that no longer will the, the architect step away after design build or the, or the engineer, um, and and the the owner has it and takes it, but they will help them maintain their their digital twin, help them maintain their their building assets and keep them updated as renovations happen, as um, projects take place. And so I think you're going to see a lot of that, and there'll be more kind of ongoing services from architects and engineers moving forward. I, I also think there's two key technologies that are really going to explode in the next few years. 
and, and the first one is the the whole idea of augmented reality. We see tons of virtual reality nowadays where you, you put on the goggles and you can't see anything else except what's in there. I mean, it's just immersive screen is all it is. But this idea of augmented reality, which we're seeing some of is really going to become mainstream where um, I can be on site, let's say a construction site and through my glasses or through an iPad, I can see what's being built, but overlaid on top of it, I can see the digital version of that. So I know what pipes are behind that wall or what the dimensions are supposed to be for something. I think that that is going to play a huge role and it's going to force architects, engineers, designers to be much more accurate with their models than they are now. The other big technology I think that's going to change, especially in the field, is flexible screens. You know, right now we print and we print tons of stuff. And sure, there are some people walking around with iPads on many sites and, and using BIM 360 to access the information they want. But those screens are still really small. And so as we get into these flexible screens where I could just roll it out and have as big or as small of a screen I want, I think that's going to fundamentally change how um, contractors, subcontractors, architects, engineers work with drawings and accessing um, data and information. So that's my two cents. We're right uh, a couple minutes over. I think we're going to um, cut it off there. Again, we have captured all of your questions. If we didn't get to it today, we will follow up with you and make sure that we do. Um, any of those links that we put in the chat, we'll also send out. And this was recorded, so anybody can review it later on. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you from our team today, and um, hope you have a wonderful day.